Okay, I'm trying a little different thing here with the light um, because it's not quite right. I want to be able to fire this light off in different different directions. Um, I don't know, just to throw some light around the shed. No, it's too dazzling. Um, yeah, just I'm trying to throw some light around the shed without. Um, without tying it down too far, but it's kind of difficult because I end up tying it in place with some red wire. Oh, I, am I colour blind? This green wire, garden wire is what I really meant to say. Um, and it won't cut. Uh, so anyway, I will end up having to tie some around it again because uh, it gets a bit in the way. But I'm trying to get the trying to get this lamp to just point be able to point upwards and throw some light on the ceiling now and then. Uh, so I will try a bit more with this green wire twiny stuff. Right, so where do we want to keep it to? About there. Um, yeah, it's hard to, I, I, I'm saying, you know, we don't need any more unpleasantness in the world, there's, there's enough this week as it is, and it's, it's kind of hard to, to do anything, uh, it's, for me it's hard to carry on just doing guitars and not have a, have a view on what's been happening this week, so I'm kind of sorry if I mention it a few times, but I'm probably going to. Um, Right, so the first thing, let's just have a quick look. Um, on, the, on this guitar, sorry about the camera angle at the moment, I'll probably try moving it around. Certainly will, if I can't see the bleeding, can't see the reading on this, the bleeding reading. Right, I'm getting a one, 1.5 millimeters uh, at the top there, and I won't do it with that, I'll do it with the, um, Gauge. To be frank, 1.5 is not a bad action. Um, I sold a, a V100 a couple of weeks ago um, to to a guy in Leeds. And um, okay, where is the filler gauge now? Yeah, I sold a one a couple of weeks ago, and um, the, when he got it, he found the action had some buzzing, uh, and that's probably because it was down to about a millimetre, so um, here that can be a little bit low sometimes, so uh, with a bit of luck he's going to, um, so I should put my Skype actually, yeah he's, he's going to be having a go uh, today at just raising the bridge very very slightly, and um, he was, no I don't want Spotify. <laughs> I don't know whether this makes a noise. I don't think it does because it's um, it's Wi-Fi and not 3G. Um, but yeah, he's going to have a go today. He wanted to have a go today to um, lower the uh, raise the action slightly um, to just iron out that buzzing. Which now this, interestingly, this is very very low. So th I would I would wager that this has been um, set professionally in the past, which is good to see. In fact, it's even lower than I would go. That's interesting. So somebody's skating close to the limit. That's about a 0.2 millimetre gap there. Um, okay, who's who's Unos 380? I don't know who that is, but I think that's um, that's the guy. If that, if he calls through, then I'm going to um, I'm going to have to cut off uh, and just take care of that. But so in the meantime, yeah, this 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 one here. Um, I'll just show you how conveniently I've set this up. Wow, it is Ruben, Mr. V100. Okay, so um, I've got that Velcro to my um, pillar drill, so uh, it's not going to be any problems with this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I found that the tablet's great for that. I got it for Christmas, um, so I can I can look up YouTube help or, or any forums or whatever while I'm here without having to have a laptop out in the uh, workshop. Yes, so this this is set really really low, um, which is kind of pleasing. So I'm I'm taking that 
that's giving me a hint that I think um, I think we're going to find that these frets are, if not level, then largely level. Okay, that's my prediction. I think I predicted about 35%. All right, but um, let's just get fire straight off into it. Um, we'll we'll take all the strings off, uh, do a clean up of everything once the strings are off, and then we'll. Um, in fact, I'll take most of the components out because I want to give all of this a really good clean, as always. Um, and then when we put it back together again, we'll be looking for. Uh, I mean, we can't raise that uh, nut or first fret action, so we won't be doing that. As it is, it's pretty fine, and we shouldn't have any problems with it. Um, this is Claire. Hello, sweetie. Say hello to the world of guitar people. Hello. This is um, this is Darren's guitar and I've got, I've just uh, hooked up on Skype with Ruben, he's talking through possibly lowering, uh, raising his bridge on his V100. So it's, I'm raising the roof. Yeah. So it's a, a V100 flavoured afternoon here in the real workshop. Uh, do you feel badly when you do that? No. Yeah, I kind it's of. Odd, yeah, it? it is, because the strings aren't exactly worn out. No, but just, it's not the natural thing to. No. It, it feels, it can feel like a waste, but mm. it's this thing I have to tell myself that I've got to do it in order to get this all yeah. really sorted and yeah. clean. That's Meg. Yeah, that's a very 80s word, actually. Mm. Young people watching might not know. Anyway. Dear Meg, do you not? Yeah, finger goo. Um, so I'm going to just put on hold and do some domestic things, okay, ma'am? And all the babies are about to claw their way in as well. Hold on. I just love Velcro, so what I'm doing with my Amazon tablet-y thing, uh, I'm going to stick some more Velcro. I always make sure I've got some Velcro knocking about in the shed, um, because now I can just peel off these little bits, and I can give myself a new tablet mount, which is sort of, oh, where's the buttons? I never know where these things go. I'm going to now stick those bits of um, Velcro to the wood and give myself a new mount for this tablet. Might not push too hard, but there we have it. Pull it off, push those on again. And now I can mount my tablet and take calls. And it's actually better than over there. But if I don't want it here, I can put it over there. Um, if I needed to, I could actually screw in those bits of Velcro as well to make them stick. But this, this position over here was actually uh, better. Um, before talking uh, over there, it wasn't exactly getting me at all. So, there we have it. We are in the 22nd century, uh, along with Flash Gordon, in the cyber studio of the future. Okay, uh, let's get down to the business. Again, I say, if, if Ruben calls on Skype, I will cut off. Um, right, down to business. You can see the dust on this. It's not been cleaned in a long time, so... Um, one of the first things we can do for it is find a cloth and start throwing around, uh, making with the cleaning goo. But actually, before I do that, I think what I want to do is take off the various attachments. For example, the um, something went dark there. I don't know what that was. We we'll take off the uh, scratch plate for the time being and um, we've got to be careful that there's a not careful but there's a little nut spinning under there which has got to come off. I said come off. Can we hold it? Difficult to get ah, get my finger on it. There we are. And uh, this is actually one gauge, so we change that. Yeah, so the process of, of doing this uh, guitar, that typical reloved setup, is to take everything off the guitar and um, give it a good clean, and then to put everything back together after I've done the, um, the fret leveling and reprofiling and polishing. Okay, so we make sure that we've got the little 
not that it goes with it as well. All these components I'm putting in here for the time being, but I will come back to them uh, and give them a good polish or clean up. Um, sorry, the camera angle's not good for this. So yeah, it's just taking it all off uh, to, to get to the, the surfaces of the guitar so that the um, we can polish, clean up first and then if necessary later on polish the finish. Um, and in doing so then obviously we're going to get all the, the various components going to end up in a jar, a container, like that. Um, but it also then leaves us free access to the surfaces here. Um, so that we can do our clean, uh, our finish cleaning. So here's the difficult one. It is getting these knobs off. Um, there are ways to do this. Usually a two-handed pull will do it. But you have to be kind of persistent uh, and patient. They will come off, but it doesn't feel like they are. And I'm using, literally having to use both hands to achieve that. That's as far down as I can point. It's much better than putting something on and levering them off, although you can do that without any damage, providing you either mask off the area or put a cloth down first. Um, so that's as much as we'll take off from there. No need to take anything else off. Um, I don't, I've tested the guitar. There's nothing uh, wrong with it. Uh, there's no problems with it electrically, but I will take these off. Um, out, of, out of sheer nosiness, um, just to check there's nothing untoward um, and it really gives me an opportunity as, as a guitar person to, to notice any weird um, electrical setups um, so I can learn something from it um, but it also if I, I can also check and see if there are any um, kind of issues with wires uh, being loose that are threatening to come off and head those things off And everything just goes straight into the box of, of kit. And so far, I'm pleased to say that I've never lost a piece component from any guitar. Um, even if I did, I've got quite a bit of... Oh, there's one that's spinning because it's already stripped out its thread. Um, I've got quite a bit of spare components to make up for anything, any little things like screws that get lost. So I'm going to... I'm using a, a blade here to get underneath this particular screw and try and lift it out. There you go, I've got a bit of bite on it and then I'll just rotate this. Now I will probably end up, yeah, you can see that it's uh, somewhere along the way it's stripped out the, um, the wood here so we need to build that up with some material. Um, oh it's tea time again! That was fine. Um, it's a life. Live in the shed and get tea delivered. Okay, so just to, uh, I, I tell you what, what I won't do is move the guitar around. I will move the camera around. That's what I put it on this thing for. Uh, so in there, you've got an absolutely bog standard um, V100 wiring, small pots, um, your two little capacitors there, and quite a lot of slack wiring down in here. I've noticed about those guitars, and there's an overhang too. So there's a big hollow. Very big cavity in this one. Um, in fact, it's a huge cavity. It's chambered. Wow, they've, they've removed some... I've never seen that. Have I ever seen that? I don't think I have. On this guitar... Ooh, let me get an extra light for this. I've not seen... I don't remember seeing... Could be completely wrong. I don't remember seeing uh, a cavity this deep. Wow, look at that. Lordy. This guitar is so heavy, and yet they've taken out tons of material. See? Now, if I'd not taken the back off, I wouldn't have learned that. I'd never have seen that. I've never noticed it on the V100 before. Of course, it doesn't mean to say that they aren't all like that. I've just never seen it. So, you live and learn. Great big gap under here. Um, reducing some of the weight on this. I don't think, in fact, I'm pretty sure, that this monster here hasn't got such an equivalent... That's rock solid, this P99, V99, it's rock solid. So this has been chambered a bit, and that is a surprise to me because I've not noticed it on any other 
V100 to date. Right, just back to where we were. So, uh, at the moment, I'm going to take off, also going to take off the strap buttons for now, just so I've got a clean surface to work on to, to give it a polish. Difficult, if you don't take the strap buttons off, then you're, you're kind of working around them when you come to clean the, the polish the finish. Um, and it only takes two seconds, so you might as well. And it also gives you the chance to examine them and check, see whether the um, thread and the hole are still up to the job. Um, there's nothing worse than a loose strap button, because what it ultimately ends up with uh, is the strap button woggling about, never gets tightened, and as it woggles about, it gradually erodes the, the hole, and you end up with um, the strap button falling out. Okay, so, so that's, um, that's that. Now what I'm also going to do is when I turn this over, I'm going to place a foam block just under the neck part here, because I just want to take the pressure off that um, switch. Uh, and I'm going to get my manual screwdriver at this point to remove the uh, tuners. And again, the same, exactly the same reason. Why am I taking these off? There's no reason, they work perfectly well, but it gives me a chance to clean them, but also to clean the, um, to check them, and to clean the headstock underneath, which makes the whole thing look a hell of a lot nicer. And if there are any lack of repairs that I wanna do, then it gives me cl uh, clear access to do those. Um, okay, so it'll just be, a set of tuners and screws chucked in the box, which we'll uh, come back to later on. And it'll be easy to tell which side is which because the tuner petal, the tulip, tulip, that's what, um, who was it that told me? James, I think it was, in the YouTube comment. I was struggling for, to know what the word was. And it was petal shape, uh, I'm doing it again, tulip shape. Tuners, tulip tuners, uh, made by Wilkinson, of course, and they're the Wilkinson Deluxe tuners. So, as I say, a lot of this process of taking things off is really good because you just, not enforce you, but it gives you a chance to check everything through. Um, it sort of, not only check things through, but you can clean things and pay attention to all those details. I've seen people, I mean, there's a lot of models of people doing things on eBay with a lot of ways of doing things, business models. Um, and one of them, I won't mention names, but there's a guy who I was interested to follow a little bit, who buys, you've probably, some of you have probably seen him, he buys uh, seven string guitars and then sort of quite crudely converts them to six string guitars specifically for why, uh, huge handed people which I've said a number of times is, is a great idea but something about the, the guy who who's um, well it's a good idea uh, and he, he's got some really good attention to some of the aspects of the setup which I wholeheartedly agree with like the getting the correct action of the first fret um, there, there's something about his guitars which many people have complained about I've seen it in comments uh, that his guitars are really filthy and, and it's like they've never been cleaned up once, once the conversion work was done and I think that to me it's a real it's a, it's a lost opportunity you know if you if you're going to get a, um, a guitar and you're going to you want to you create an impression well yeah you create an impression by doing your modification to it and in his case that's that's making it into a, a very wide a wide spaced six string guitar in my case, it's a setup guitar, low action, um, good setup. But in both cases, you really want to be um, creating the best impression you can. Uh, there's no point doing all that stuff and then creating a naff impression because you didn't, you didn't clean the thing. So it struck me as a bit odd, really. Anyway, so we've got these ferrule walls which need to come out, and sometimes they come out peacefully. I have to be careful not to poke these things through my hands um, and it's just using an allen key to poke them through sometimes if necessary i have to sort of set them up and give them a tap with a hammer but to do that i need to be very careful to support the, um, the headstock on either side 
so we don't put any unnecessary pressure on the neck. But in this case, it's it's working with a push and some oh, <laughs> support. It's my cat fur sticking to it. Jeez. Yeah, that's safer than whacking it. I will hit it if I have to, but um, I can feel that these are that there's enough tolerance in there to allow me to do it by hand, by, by, by gentle persuasion as opposed to violence. Um, I say that, but these last two are going to, uh, last one is probably going to try and prove me wrong. Aren't you? No, sad. Okay, so those are the ferules out as well. And so we have ourselves a clean headstock, um, which we can um, polish up nicely. And while we're at it, uh, I can also, and I use a finer point, I can also remove the truss rod cover because I'm going to want to adjust. I may need to adjust the truss rod, I may not. Um, now that purpose of the truss rod adjustment at this stage in the game is to um, is to prepare the neck for any fret leveling work and we need the neck to be level if we're going to fret level. Um, we can't do it if the neck has any relief or bend in it. So I'm just going to push the screwdriver out of the way. So what we have here um, is the guitar stripped off most of its well, not all of it, but some of it's hardware. Um, but it gives us a clean surface all the way around, uh, and we can we can work on the neck in that just like that, um, and we can do all the work we need to do from this point with this off. And it also then allows us to clean the body and the hardware that's remaining, but also to give this stuff a bit of a clean as well and an inspection. So it's really really handy. Now, what I have here is my actually this isn't the right cloth. It's got some other stuff on it. I've got cloth here which I use often for um, wiping down with a solvent and um, it's interesting because this this is a, a video that's di directed at perhaps newcomers who haven't ever seen me do this before. It's also uh, aimed at some people who have watched me do this stuff for hours on end. You need a special psych psychiatric nurse to come and visit you. Uh, and it's also in this case directed, or a, a, a speaking directly to Darren, whose guitar this is. So it's kind of an unusual uh, experience to be talking directly to somebody whose guitar it is. But anyway, so if I break into a calling you Darren and you're not Darren, but Darren is watching as well, uh, please forgive me because I'm speaking to the owner. Now we've got that uh, convention cleared up. So I'm using naphtha, which is um, lighter fluid, and it's a kind of petroleum-y based burning stuff. So it's both uh, hallucinogen, no, you know, intoxicant, intoxicant uh, as well as um, inflammable. So you've got to be careful with it. Um, but you can see that it, it having, we've got a loose, yeah, a little loose um, jack socket there. Having taken all the bits off we got a clear run at all the cavities and shapes and surfaces um, to give it a, a first clean. This isn't a final clean by the way this is just the this is just to get the basic grime off it. Um, let's do that thing again just take some more pressure off the switch. Um, yeah this is a, a kind of prime uh, what's the word? Preliminary is the word I was trying to find get to my age 52 nearly and you stop forgetting words um, which is okay because you don't need as many uh, yeah so preliminary clean uh, I'll get another clean cloth from up here just to get a rub down um, and it, it it leaves a sort of wash across it but actually when you then swipe it with a clean cloth it takes it off but it's also it gets rid of ground in gunk like um, fingerprints, grease, that sort of stuff, label, sticker, glue, all of that stuff that comes off with this solvent. So it's really, really useful. Um, 
you know, an, an, an example of somebody who uh, taught me something useful, but in the wrong spirit, was the guy who insulted me and lambasted me for polishing guitars, budget guitars, I have to add, with um, Mr. Sheen. And, you know, uh, there was a whole debate about what silicon does to the, um, the polyurethane finish and whether it makes it easy or difficult or impossible for uh, luthiers to make repairs and so on if you've put any silicon stuff on your guitar. Uh, and it's a very valid argument and on the basis of the, the information that I found out and that he alerted me to I, I stopped using it and just bought myself some industrial volumes of naphtha. And um, so it's you know great to to learn stuff um, but it was just delivered in such an unpleasant way and I, as I said earlier on in this I hate I hate that you know if we're if we're all sharing this planet for a start um, and more than that if we all like guitars and we're in the same sort of area of interest well you know let's not let's sort of share information you know? let's not treat each other like crap so I kind of decided not long after couple more rude people that um, for me this these videos were going to be uh, an abuse free zone and you know if people are abusive I'm just going to flag and block their contributions because I haven't got time for that sort of negativity you know and if you're my age already you'll know exactly what I mean and if you're not my age I promise you when you get to my age you're going to suddenly discover that your life is also too short to fill with negativity and you're going to be in the same kind of thinking about things the same way. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm doing a sort of courtesy hygiene thing to these guitars, which I always do, which is to remove the previous owner's DNA, by and large, from the fingerboard. It also takes away quite a bit of the finger grease. So immediately afterwards, the fingerboard uh, does look a bit dry, and the, as a very final step before restringing, I will put some a little bit of oil on, but only enough to just darken the surface. Um, because too much just becomes a uh, kind of sticky attractor for dust. Um, now, just noticing these pickups right here and now, um, I'm going to wind them all in because when I come to do the fret work, I don't want them uh, kind of getting in the way of the fret leveling file. But they are already, I noticed when I was playing it earlier on, they are already pretty flattened into their cavities. So um, that would have been having some effect on the, the kind of output levels. So um, I'm going to make sure that when we put this all back together again, these pickups, and this one's right, sunken right into there. In fact, just judging by this, it's not doing anything at all. So we do need to take this off at some point. I'm going to put that in there to keep it safe. This one is, that's why it's sunken in there. The spring or the, the bite has gone from where it goes through underneath, so we'll have to take that one out. Eh, you know, small thing. Okay, so here we are, ready to start doing some stuff. Um, now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check, by the way, this it looks gr grubby because um, the naphtha does leave a sort of tide mark when you're using it, but it's very easy to get it off, um, so don't worry about it. And we'll be doing a proper sort of polish over before we finish anyway. Not, I am hasten to add, using Mr. Sheen, but using naphtha and where necessary, um, kind of scratch removal cream um, to get any final scratches out. Okay, so at this point in the game, I'm looking down and trying to judge uh, the straightness or otherwise of this neck in its relaxing, relaxed position. Um, and with, it's got no pressure on from the, um, from the strings. So ideally, you kind of want, when you take the strings off you really would sort of expect the neck to level out. In this case it's actually still got quite a bit of concavity in it so the first thing I'm going to do is to get the right um, thingy, allen key, into the end here and I'm going to have a look and see whether the truss rod works and if it does work, which I'm hoping to goodness it does, you never can know this before you buy it, um, then what I will do is I'll make the adjustment. Everything's still running. Yes, I'll make the adjustment. Um, let's see. What do I want to do? I want to tighten it up to um, flatten out the neck. So I'm going to go clockwise 
with this uh, a small amount. Not a huge amount, just sort of feeling for... Yeah, it feels like it's working. You, you sort of can tell it's got a bit of bite to it, or a bit of resistance. It's also quite common, I've found, to end up with guitars um, where one side of the neck is flat when you look down at it and the other side is concave or convex and so it's it's quite often that you don't have a single level thing there's a bit of it's not even a twist that way it's a it's kind of a twist uh, it's hard to say really it's a flaring of the neck on one side it buckles on one side and stays straight on the other uh, if you find yourself in that situation and, and you're about to try and do some fret leveling there's not a lot you can do other than go for a compromise between the two um, and probably pay greater attention to the edge where you're going to do most of your playing, which is the treble edge. Um, so this one still has a little bit more uh, concavity to remove, but I, th I can see that the adjustment has already made a difference, so that's quite good. It's too subtle to be able to um, demonstrate to you on the, on the camera. Okay, and I'll put a bit more tighten tightening into that. I think that should probably do it, but we'll leave it a minute or two. I've, so far, I've not found it, I've never seen it be necessary to leave something for 24 hours, although I don't doubt that some things change over time. Um, I've not noticed that myself. You know, and, and I, this is, a, I keep putting these caveats on things so that when I say something, you know, I want you to take it always as my experience, right? I haven't read all the books in the world. I haven't read hardly any because they seem to be quite hard to read these, um, how to books. I haven't done this for very long, no more than a year, so I don't know everything, and um, you know, and I could be wrong at any one point in time. So that's my caveat for all all stages of this. I could be wrong. I'm just saying in my experience. So I, I always frame things in those in those words because if you know, as I say, if your experience is different, let me know about it because it's really useful. Um, so in my experience. I haven't had to wait overnight for um, truss rod changes to take effect, but you may have had another experience. By the way, while we're at it, there is an interesting um, underneath, there's a sort of paint blemish um, underneath the lacquer. Uh, there's a couple of little scratches here and there too, but under the, under the lacquer there's an original paint blemish. You can see where it's run. Uh, or you might even, no, it's a, it's, it's a paint problem, I think, from the sunburst. And something's run and then it's been lacquered over. So it is a, it's a mild imperfection, but I don't know what it's, it's hardly noticeable. And in fact, it's mostly covered by the, the plastic button. Knob is the word I should have been using. Anyway, okay, so just about leveled out on that side. Marginally concave on that side. I am going to tweak it a little bit more. I'm also going to be cautious that there are wires sticking out here that I don't want to scrape against things if I can help it. I'm going to leave that back part off because I need to sort of fill that or build up that um, part of the wood that's gone where the screw goes in. I don't have to but it's, it just makes it a little easier. So a bit more and that's starting to stiffen up a lot so I think that's as much as I want to do anyway. We'll call it, probably, probably be able to call that quits in a moment. So, Darren's V100. So, so far, chip on the finish down here by the input jack. There is a chip on the top here uh, on one of the corners. Can't, see, can't quite see where it is now, but there's a chip up there. The pickup um, isn't isn't anchored properly here, so we'll need to take that out and have a look. There is a chip on the eleventh uh, fret, which is there, uh, which which is causing um, scratching. Is it eleventh? Yeah, somewhere around there. It's causing scratching when you try and play, uh, but otherwise it's all in good shape, and there are no other surprise no other surprises we found from taking it. Part, and that's the interesting bit. Okay, one more quick check. 
I'm looking sideways down here because I, I want to put as little gravity on pu uh, pulling the neck backwards as possible. Okay, that's almost flat as we're going to get it. And that allows me to prepare to do the next bit, uh, which is going to be masking off the neck ready for um, fret leveling work, or, or at least fret checking, checking the levels, I should say. Um, and just as a quick check here, um, I can run along and there you go, first fret. Wow, pretty major. Second fret. I'm going to be proved wrong. It's amazing that there was as good an action as there was, because the first three frets I checked there have got problems. So I'm reaching up for some masking tape, which is over there. And I'm going to begin the process. Uh, the, the camera is currently on top of, it was sort of tied to a microphone, which is pushed into a microphone stand itself. So uh, it allows me quite a lot of flexibility to put it up and down and move it around. So anyway, you can see quite well. I'm going to just lift the base of the guitar to give myself a bit of room and you've got a good shot. So when it comes to masking off the neck, the purpose of this is just to protect your precious fingerboard, uh, which is the, the place where you interact with your guitar. Um, so I'm going to use my masking tape, which cost me £1.10 a roll from the market here in Tavistock. And I'm going to use as much as I need without worrying about it because it's so cheap. Um, and what I want to do is protect this fingerboard, not just for my customer, but it same for me if I was um, doing this for myself. I, I want to make sure that I don't do any damage at all when I'm working on the frets because the working on the frets is quite a destructive process in the sort of in industrial sense of the word, meaning, meaning that we are, we are kind of taking away, scraping away metal abrasively um, in order to achieve the outcome we want. Um, and so just as we're taking away metal, if we get it wrong and expose any fingerboard, we're liable to ruin that in the same process, which we don't want to do. So you can see straight away that the first few frets are pretty easy to do, um, but then you come to the next ones and you can see I'm sort of struggling to, uh, I'm in danger of covering up the fret because the tape is now too wide. Um, and what I can do with this one is cheat a little bit so I can stretch it, put it on as tight as I can between the frets and just to make sure there's no, um, there's no, nothing covering up the frets because I really need them access to them what I can do is just run down here with a blade and just hoik off this little bit so I know that it's still covered but I the fret is free it is, is exposed fully and the same on this side but I really don't want to be doing that for everyone so um, what I'm going to do next is put the guitar down and get myself a chopping board and go through a slightly laborious process cutting lots of custom made pieces um, to do the job and like I said this is on one level this looks really really anal and boring um, but it's really really necessary so I got myself a chopping board which you can see I've actually used here before um, it's got quite a bit on here that I could already use but it just kind of makes it <laughs> sort of works but it makes it a bit fiddly because I'm still going to have to cut more but Okay, I've done some cutting before and let's just, for now, let's carry on using this at the highest. I know that the way this stuff works is that the thin bits, uh, when I cut it into thirds, cut the tape into thirds, I can use it for the thinnest of gaps, um, which is what I'm going to do here now, since I know that I've got to fill these in. Um, and the reason I use a chopping board and go through this process quite laboriously is because to do this accurately, I'm going to be I'm going to need to, to believe that these bits of paper will go up in a straight line against the frets, um, not sort of in a curvy line exposing fingerboard. And then when I get them in place, I sort of push them into the step and then press them down. And I'm going to go over all of this area here with masking tape when I've done the small stuff. So I'm just going to use up all this paper for the, uh, the masking tape for the time being 
um, since I've already cut it out and no point throwing it away since it costs money really um, so so it's just a process a, a fairly long-winded process of taking the time to carefully and that's pulled out some wood which I don't want in the mix so just carefully making sure that every part of our fingerboard is protected and as I say the only really uh, method methodical way to do this is to cut pre-cut strips with a straight edge um, and that will allow you to, to be confident that you've covered your entire fretboard with no gaps so you can see that if if you're kind of the person who, who struggles to stick with detail this might not be a job you'd like to do because there's always ten, temptation to sort of skip it and just run on with it as fast as you can but um, you know heartily encourage you to get into the discipline or the rigor of doing this slowly and, and dependably um, and you know if you've got if you're doing this kind of work and you've got a you know your favorite radio station stick the radio on or put a film on or whatever it is that, you know, to kind of occupy your brain while you're doing it um, Right, so I've used up my leftover stuff and I'm pressing it right down as hard as I can. And put the guitar to one side and then get back to the process of preparing some more. And I'm just going to do it full on as if i got to do the whole thing from scratch. Um, so I just basically I'm cutting four, four pieces at once, uh, or four pieces on a board. And um, I'm just going to cut them with a straight edge, as I said. Um, cut off these straggly bits just because I'm OCD or something. And it looks nicer. And I feel better for doing it. it tells you something, doesn't it? So the first two I'm going to cut into thirds and... You know, like I say, this is tr dreary, but it pays off. You just do it, don't think about it, and you've got yourself ready, ready cut stuff. So two of these strips into thirds. And I'm just guessing it, I'm not measuring it. Um, it's not that critical. What's more important is that the lines you're cutting are straight. So, so Darren, you said you wanted to see the video of this, okay? You asked for it bad news for all of you people is that uh, last week I lost the SD card for the GoPro which meant I had to do some video using the flip camera the flip ultra HD which is it's a nice little camera but it's much narrower angle than the GoPro and uh, doesn't store as much stuff but anyway so having lost the SD card the first thing I thought was well, I can't afford to lose that and it can't afford to be held up whilst looking for it in case I'd washed it in the um, washing machine or something so I went and bought another one to give myself uh, a backup if I found the other one but to, you know, to allow me to carry on working if I didn't find the other one um, and I went and bought a 64 gigabyte one which is in the camera right now and having um, I, th I don't know why but I thought the original one was 64 gigabytes anyway when I found the original uh, a few hours later um, I, I was kind of amazed to find it was only 16 gigabytes. So all the stuff, the, the sort of rhythm of doing We Love Guitar work previously um, was all based around kind of running out of video after about two hours of recording and having to go back inside and dump all that video onto a hard disk ready for compiling later in the week. Um, and now... Uh, with 64 gigabytes, I can just keep going forever. Of course, the process won't take any longer just because I've got more memory. Anyway, boring little detail for you, but it's those nerdy people who like these sort of things will, will know how pleasing it is to think, hey, I've got four times as much storage space on this um, camera now than I had before. Like, it really matters. Just means I could stay out here all evening without going in. I do, I still have a problem of that vast volume of video data to um, crunch and 
process. But actually, the, um, the sequence I've got going is, is working pretty well at the moment. Um, what am I trying to do here? Somebody tell me. I am trying to move the camera to a place country roads, West Virginia, to a place it belongs. No, I'm just, oh my goodness, I'm trying not to swear. Uh, I just want to give you a different view, and now I've had to sort of rearrange the world to do it. There, lovely. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole thing about processing the video, I had loads of video uh, kind of stacked up over Christmas, and the reason I did is because the broadband at home is just completely in, inadequate to upload these large video files. Um, so I have to wait till I'm up in London at work where the broadband is civilised. And um, usually off, on into the evenings I can just kind of stay in the office and hog the bandwidth and uh, upload all these videos. So this week at work, even though it was a short week, I, uh, I was able to up, first of all compile... Um, about half a dozen videos for all the work I've done over the Christmas break. Um, and by compiling, I mean taking all the uh, two gigabyte chunks that the GoPro produces, however long the actual setup is. The GoPro outputs or stops after about one, actually it's about 1.4 gigabytes and then restarts and carries on. So you end up with a load of um, chunks of video. So the first thing I did this week was to um, set a load of those uh, compiling into single .mov files. Um, that's not good. Uh, and then kind of very diligently, once those had compiled, transfer those to a hard disk, clear the space on my computer hard disk, and then to um, start the process of uploading them to YouTube. And once they're uploaded, then deleting them completely from the hard disk to clear space. So I'm constantly managing hard disk because each setup video, probably before it goes up to YouTube, because it gets compressed at YouTube, and, but before it goes up there, uh, on my hard disk, each three hour setup probably takes about 10 gigabytes or 12, some, between 7 and 12 gigabytes, um, which is a hell of a lot of space. And if you don't kind of do your housekeeping as you go along, which re requires quite a focus of knowing where you are. Um, you can very easily run out of disk space and then suddenly you're in a kind of traffic jam where there's absolutely not enough room on your computer to process the next film and you can't do, you can't get rid of the video, the raw video if you like, until you've processed it and turned it into a single film and then you're in a sort of roadblock, gridlock, I suppose, a memory gridlock. Anyway, I'm sure you really wanted to know all that. But the good thing for me was that I managed to clear that backlog in just in a couple of days in London this week. So now we're back to where we should be. The other thing I discovered last week was that I seem to have used up a third of my total YouTube allocation, which given that I've probably got about 53 hour videos on YouTube for free, thank you very much YouTube, Google, um, I think it's pretty damn good and to be honest I think I'm just going to get to somewhere close to my maximum allocation which will be you know whatever let's have the, what did I say a third of my stuff so let's say we, I could get about 600 videos up there in total at that sort of length then I would be um, quite happy and I'd probably start throwing away the very early ones and keep the more recent ones Anyway, so here's here's a first stage. I've got you can see I've got um, all of the uh, fingerboard covered, and now I'm just going to take the time to cover up all of the uh, exposed edges where the, the either the fret leveling file or the um, sandpaper that I'm going to use later on might come into contact, and we don't want it to. Right, so I'm just going to do my best now to cover up all of this part of the guitar in such a way as it's not going to interfere with what I've got to do but um, it's thoroughly protected um, so I'm not you can see I'm not being too precise about it I just I just want to get a good solid covering of all of this part of the guitar so that when I'm doing sandpapering there's no likelihood of anything kind of rubbing the, the finish here and causing any 
problems. And my experience is that I don't have to go further than that. And actually, I don't really need to do much on this side. Although sandpaper sometimes can run run over here and just you might get a, a scratch on the side there. So it is worth just going around this exposed edge as well. Um, again, it's a bit it's a bit ugly, but I'm just protecting the paintwork. That's all. All you care about really is that it will stay on just about. Okay, so I'm just going to cover it over longitudinally as well, just to make sure it stays down. Again, it's all on the principle that this masking tape is dirt cheap by comparison to the beautiful finish, um, which may not be expensive, but it will take you one hell of a lot of time to put it right if you get some scratches on here while you're doing this work, because then you'll end up with your sandpaper and your multi-mesh stuff um, to get it back up to a nice shiny uh, finish that it was before you scratched it. Okay, so I'm just kind of squashing all this down so it doesn't peel off suddenly. Um, now, somebody said, I've forgotten who it was now, forgive me, but I think it was Patrick actually. Um, Patrick, on a comment on a video, suggested that I try and what did he what did he suggest? He suggested running a strip down the side to help take off all of this stuff at the end. And I'm, to be honest, there's a good reason for doing that anyway because it protects the uh, the edges of the, the um, binding um, below the frets because they're still exposed. So to cover that up is seems like a really smart idea. Whether or not it will help me get this stuff off at the end. Or whether the um, what's the word the stickiness of the other stuff onto the neck will prove stronger than the bond between masking tapes is anyone's guess. But there you go. I've I've given that a go. I've covered it. I've covered up the, those exposed squares or strips of neck, which is no bad thing anyway. For the sake of a couple of extra seconds of effort, um, I'm going to do the same for the other side. And then we'll just see if this facilitates a bit of easier uh, escape at the end when it comes to pulling off the paper. Now right now, as I say, it, it's no harm at all doing it because it does, in fact, protect the exposed parts of the neck, which would otherwise just stay exposed. Which, I, in my experience, haven't ever got damaged. Um, but we're not doing any harm at all adding that extra degree of protection. <laughs> Right, so here we go. So we've, just do a mental check if you're gonna do this. We have uh, checked for straightness, and if you want, if you've worried about the, um, the truss rod adjustment taking effect over time, just double check it, right? Is it still straight? If it's suddenly gone into a convex position, you'll know that it's carried on working after we adjust it. In fact, it's exactly as it was, so I've got no worries at all. I'm going to put a little bit of support on this neck. It's going to be under a gravitational pull a little bit. All right, we recognise that. Um, therefore, it isn't quite the same as if it was in playing position. There is a bit of tilt downwards, um, but not a huge amount. Okay, and I'm, it's, it, I, we can either support it at that end or that end. This end. Um, hello. Hello. Come in. No. No. Why not? Because we're going. Are oh, you going footy? Yeah. Okay, it's just, I know what you've done. Well, right. yeah, makes it nice and warm and cool. Though. There's um, the V100 that arrived today. Oh. It hasn't even been to its owner yet. So it's come here first. Oh. Nice, isn't it? Yeah. It's a good way of doing things. Yeah, very good. Give my address. I'll collect 200 guitars and then emigrate. Have a good football. See you later. See you later. Bye. Have fun. Thank you. Okay, so... Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of debatable. I, I'm going to take a bit of pressure off the end there with a the block, um, but it's still pretty straight. So, to do this work now, I'm going to get myself uh, a couple of tools. First thing, the fret rocker, and then the pencil for marking, and then the uh, marker pen for uh, something we'll show you in a minute. While I'm at it, I'm going to hook up this camera to some power. 
so that in the middle of all of this we don't just go fizzle and I have to start again. Since I'm going to be in one position for a while, might as well just put it in and have a static charge working. Okay, I'm not sure how well it even looks from this angle. So given I've done that, I'm going to move that. I'm going to now do this and a bit of that. Move that around to there. Shove that over there. And something like that. So we've got a different, yeah, different position. It's not too bad. You're not getting dazzled. No, good. You're looking straight down at the action. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the fret rocker now. We're still recording. Everything is good. We're on 40 minutes. All right. Use the fret rocker. And the, the way the fret rocker works... Oh, can, I just, can I just turn this without dazzling you? Yeah, I think that... Uh, you can still see it. Something like that. The fret rocker, you put it across three frets, which is why it's got different edges, because um, you're going to need to use different size edges as you go up. You only cover three at a time. And the idea is, if you put it across three, you try and see if you can rock it from side to side across the middle one. And if you can, it means that relative to the others, the middle one is high. It doesn't mean the middle one is actually high. It could be that the other ones are low. Um, but what you do is you mark up where that appears high. Do you want to go outside a minute? Want to go out and play in the big windy night? So, first one we tried, we mark up. Next one, move along. Not right on the edge, into the middle, and not on the other edge. So it's about here on that one. And we just carry on changing. Oh, blimey. I've seen some really uneven ones here. Quite a bit at that end, a little bit at this end. Um, yeah, we've got a uh, got lot, lot of rocking going on. Hey, one that didn't. Like I said, this thing about relative evenness is quite a quite a mind warp sometimes because why are we doing any of this just to stop and take stock right well we're doing this because when you have uneven frets and all guitars seem to have them first thing when you have uneven frets um, you those the unevenness of those frets can interfere with your ability to set the action as low as you want it. Why is that? How and why does that happen? Well, if you think about the the action, of your, I don't know if you can see very well, but let's imagine your strings there, and it goes all the way along to a bridge, which is kind of a, let's say that's your action. Down here, you can see that the clearance between um, the string and the first fret is a certain amount, and it gets bigger as you go forward probably can't see very well from there but it increases and the, so the, the really sort of the dodgy one is always the first one now let's say we, we fret it here then the one after this one becomes the, the really dodgy one and it gets bigger after that so it's wherever you fret it it's always the first one which is the one that presents you with a problem now if this fret just after the one you fretted is unusually high then it's could be high enough to cancel out the gap, in which case you get um, it plays this note instead of that note, or it buzzes because it's just about contacting it. What most people do then is that they, or even at the shop or the, the factory, they will raise the action at the bridge end high enough to overcome whatever inaccuracies or, or unevenness there are in frets down here. So basically, you'll if the rule is that all guitars have uneven frets, because I haven't found any different. And if the manufacturer or the retailer retailer wants to sell it to you, they've got to set the action at some level, um, or the bridge action at some level, that will allow you to play the guitar without running into these horrible buzzes. So naturally they do it to whatever, however low they can go here without hitting those buzzes. So you can be sure on the guitar you bought just now that the playing action is, is a, uh, a compromise set to get as, as low as you can without hitting the problems inherently caused by the uneven frets. And that's that's what we're finding here. And that's 
So I can tell you that the action on this guitar, even though it was good, uh, is still restricted by these uneven frets because below that you would then start getting buzzing noises. So what we're doing is we're measuring or, or highlighting um, where these frets are uneven relative to each other. Now you wouldn't necessarily have to do this if you were going to level the frets on this guitar, um, nor would we. I'm just doing it for interest to see because I've got a, a, a kind of score chart over there on the wall which I like to keep just so I can work out if there are any patterns um, and also see if any guitars buck the trend altogether. Right? Is there, am I ever going to get a guitar with zero uh, uneven frets? I mean, some of them are really, this one is significantly uneven. So, um, so far I haven't come across a single guitar with no uneven frets. That, oh my god, this is terrible. You can hear it. Right, so, so far they all have uneven frets relative to each other. Now, all that will t this will tell us is that we've got quite a lot of unevenness and some of it's quite extreme. What we then do is it will level them all together at the same time, but it will naturally take down the highest ones even, and it will sort out which they are because we don't necessarily know which they are. We know which appear higher relative to the ones either side, but we don't know empirically whether they're higher or whether the one to the side is actually lower, creating an appearance that this one's higher. When we level it, we don't need to know. The leveling takes care of that. It, it will just take off uh, what needs to take off and it will level itself out at a good um, uniform level. What it will be able to see is that on the frets that were actually higher, it will show more materials being taken off. And we we probably, the ones I've marked here with heavy pen, we'll probably find that more is taken off these anyway, um, because it will confirm that they were in fact high. Um, but sometimes this process reveals significant low spots, which are the root of problems too. And sometimes we have to continue leveling or taking down all the frets until we bottom out those low spots. Um, because it doesn't matter whether they're high or low, they still cause the same basic problem um, because the low spot makes one other fret high relative to that low spot. And like I said, the only thing that matters is whether they are relative, uh, even relative to each other. Because they're not even kind of, um, there's no objective level. It's not like what, relative to what, the centre of the earth, the, you know, the truss rod. There's no, there's nothing fixed by which we're measuring the levelness. It is purely a relative thing. And which That's why it's really important to level the, the neck first so that we are starting with um, literally a level playing field. Okay, well my optimistic estimation of this guitar, I'm afraid, has gone out the window. Um, what's interested me is how good an action it had before. Um, so, so you know, the fact that we now have, I think we have a 22 fret guitar, two, four, I'm sure we do, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. Don't, don't castigate me for not remembering. There's so many guitars come through here. 22, of which we can measure 20. So out of 20, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Out of 20, which gives us a glorious 75%. So I was 40% off. I was, I was over ambitious and over hopeful for this guitar. So like all guitars that come through here, I'm going to cut myself some slack. Cut myself a strip to go on the leaderboard um, and I'm just going to mark up where this guitar falls. And actually, I've got vintage guitars which cross the whole range um, from... 20%, one of the best, of the very best on that we've ever seen in here. Um, vintage V100, and I'm going to write um, Darren's name on it. Um, 75%. Yeah, so we've got them ranging from 20%, which was the best ever on the whole leaderboard, right the way down to 90%. Oh, sorry, no, that was an SG. The worst... Uh, no, the worst V100. Fine. The worst V100. We've only got one on there. Okay, I must have done the other one earlier. 
Right. Okay. But I remember it coming in at about 50% at the time. So we've got we've got it crossing in from 20, 50, and 75. But this one here is down with some pretty good expensive company, so it's no surprise. The only surprise to me is that it played as well as it did. Um, okay, so moving swiftly along. This was just for interest. If you were going to level your frets, you could just start here now. You wouldn't have to do the other bit we just did. So, first part of leveling your frets, which is a three-part, three-stage process. First of all, you level them all relative to each other. Then you reprofile them all to take off the flat spot that we just put on, but without lowering or raising any of them. They've got to keep that level. And then the third part is to re-sand them down and polish them to a high degree of shine so that they play beautifully. You can see that both the fret leveling process, the reprofiling, and the um, sanding and polishing will obviously take away any surface imperfections. And right now I can see a considerable number of surface imperfections on here. This is one of the good things about taking everything off. I can see uh, scrapes and scratches from all the wound strings and so on, right the way down to this uh, this um, chip somewhere on the 11th fret, which, which makes it it shows up. And it's probably where the guitar has been banged with the string hitting the fret and causing that chip. Anyway, we move on. First stage of the first part is we take the mar marker pen and we draw across the top of the fret. Um, I guess the first assessment, which I haven't mentioned, is you would have to do is you'd have to first of all assess whether there's enough material on this on these frets for you to do this job. Um, some guitars just don't have it. Old, particularly some very old classics, like one I've got to do over the next couple of weeks, um, is a Fender Music Master, and it is worn out, and the frets have no life left in them. There is no room at all to do this work. Uh, which means the only thing we can do with it is to replace the frets. Um, which is great because it will give it a new lease of life for another 10 years, 20 years, whatever. Um, but not only this, is there not enough to do this job, there's just not enough to do anything. So this is where we kind of have to have confidence to do this and, and you don't get it, just you only get it by doing it. And this is where uh, Darren might go, oh no, my frets! We take the fret levelling file, this thing from Crimson Guitars, by the way, a great little tool, this. Um, going to just use this very rough but very flat file, and we're going to uh, run all the way down the fretboard, starting at the edge, and letting the uh, file just tip over so that it's taking a bit off the edge, and so we don't have sharp edges, and then come inwards and keep going down the prep board, keeping it as level as possible, towards the middle, and then onwards, towards the near side, and you've got to try and get all the frets involved, from the first right to the last, and then once we're on this side, again tip over, and uh, sometimes the, the switch gets in the way. So straight away, um, where's my brush? I've got some you won't be able to see it on the camera, but I've got quite a bit of shiny swarf or whatever little filings. Just going to brush all of those out of the way. And then I'm going to have a look. And what we can see straight away is that the frets that I thought were high um, pretty much confirmed. Actually, some of them are low. A couple of these frets are low, and some of them are really high, like this one marked up here is pretty high. Um, so where where, what, where I can see some have come up as showing up as um, high, this one is caused by that one being low because I can see that the, pe the pen is still on there. There's nothing been taken off. Um, and so you can often, as, it, as you work with a file, you can often start to see the bits that really are low and really are high. Bottom line is you've got to get down to, to a, a level with all of them because if we were to go and check this now, where I've got that dark spot of untouched pen, I can guarantee you we will still get... Some, some some rocking happening okay because it's telling us that we aren't bottomed out in this process now that's one run that way I recommend now is we take the file turn it round and um, tip it on the edge and then flatten it out and bring it towards ourselves right off the end taking care not to run as far as that pickup but you know you're getting this end a good covering as well 
all the way through to the middle to the near side and we're coming towards the edge on the near side and then a little bit off the corner okay now I'm just again looking back at it and what I can see is most uh, of the frets have had stuff taken off them they all look pretty well cut if you like but there's still some black spots showing up on the frets themselves which again point to uh, the fact that I'll probably find some rocking parts still because um, this is not too bad but it's just telling us that those those spots far from being high they were actually low and it's the lowness that's that's responsible I still got some going there because that is a very low spot so again we've got to get this all to the same level so we go back and do some more kind of scary in a way because we're still taking material away it's a uh, you know it literally a destructive process but on the good side we know we're confident that we can reshape all these frets and make them play really well okay so that's taken about three shots at this what I'm going to do now is I'm going to double check uh, go over the whole thing again a little bit of movement a little bit of tiny bit of clicking left in there so I'm gonna do a little bit more on this end checking all the bits that we we originally marked up um, tiny tiny bit there still that's safe that's gone it's okay it's good so we're mostly almost entirely right now that's good that one's lost all its unevenness um, and as we go through Thankfully, everything's feeling just about right. Even the bits where there's still a bit of a black pen showing, um, where we know we've got a little bit of a dip, but it's not enough to cause any problems now. Right, I'm going to stop there. We've still got loads of material on these frets. There's no, we're not in any, any danger zone. So that's stage one. Stage two, we take the marker pen and we draw over the top of these frets. Now this time we're drawing on top of the very deep gouging made by the fret leveling file and I'll show you I'll do a little quick drawing in a minute just to explain again I do apologize to any of you who've seen all this before um, please switch off and do something more interesting um, but there's a, there's a very simple and obvious common sense reason the next stage is reprofiling because we have to do this thing in, in parts. First of all, we've we've taken a, a round, you can see that, yeah. We've taken a nice round fret, and to bring all of the frets down, we've taken a bit off the top of all of them, which leaves us with this flat top, okay? So that the, the fret shape is now that. And what happens is when you have a fret that's rounded, the intonation point where the string sits is the very top of there. Okay, um, that'll make all you young men titter in the audience, no pun. But the intonation point, the, the, when the fret is correct to shape, the, the string sits right at the top, and the, so the intonation point is there, and it means the distance between, let's say, the string and the, the, nut, uh, the, the bridge is, let's say that's 100. Okay? Uh, when you chop off the top, you flatten it, and what happens is the intonation point moves to there. Okay, so let's call it, now the new distance is, I don't know, let's call it 95, whatever, so just for sake of it. So what you've done is you've actually changed the intonation um, if you were going to carry on playing it with a flat spot. And that's why you don't want flat frets. If, you, if you're buying a guitar, even if the frets are really um, shiny, but they look really flat, don't buy them because the intonation will be, or you might want to consider not buying it because the intonation will be off because the, the intonation point goes to the front leading edge of the fret. Or the flat spot. So we we've got 
everything at the right height now, okay, but we have the shape is wrong. We don't want this squared off top. Okay, so let's draw one of those. Let's try and draw it. There's a flattened top, okay, and it's got this point we don't want over there. We want it back in the middle, but we know that this height here is perfect, and it's perfect on all of them. They're all level, so we, we need to reshape this fret, but do it in a way that doesn't doesn't change that height. So what we do is we we work a, we use a tool that allows us to cut away the um, kind of shoulders of the fret to make out of that flattened shape a new rounded fret. Okay, and and that requires a, uh, a technique that's really good at removing this here, which gives us back our round shape, but without taking any height off there. Because if we do that, if we take height off there, we've wasted our effort completely. We might as well go back to square one. So that is achieved by uh, a concave um, crowning file, which is a concave tool that sits over the top of it like that, and it's, it's covered in diamond bits. And as it goes on top of the, the fret, lengthways across the fret, it starts to shave off this edge first, okay? Um, and it works its way in as it's cutting downwards, as the tool is going downwards on here, this line here, the, the remaining um, marker pen gets smaller and smaller, and our aim is to leave uh, a little strip of marker pen untouched, because if we leave that strip marker pen untouched and yet these sides rounded off, we know that this uh, height is absolutely correct still. And if we do that on every fret, we know that um, we've still retained the levelness that we've just achieved. Eons not. So that's why we use the marker pen this time round, because it's going to be instrumental in uh, when we use our jumbo um, our thingy file, what's it called? Crowning file. Um, oops, sorry. It's going to allow us to wear away the edges and retain a little thin strip down the middle saying effectively announcing to us that this tool has reshaped the edges but not touched the top and that's the most important part of this job so i'm going to do a little bit of um, work on each fret like that not too much and i'm going to stop when there is the thinnest possible black line left down the middle. And I wish you could see this because it wouldn't really make sense of it. Um, maybe you can. Hold on. You've got to catch the light right. Do you get see it through there? Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, that's what we're aiming for by the marvels of modern optics. So it's uh, just a case of running along all of these and just being patient and just keeping an eye on that black line. If you go, if you were to stand here and just run away with yourself and keep on grinding and down this fret, you could eventually rub it all down lower than the surrounding frets. Um, if you carry on going past the point where you've got that little thin black line and, and rub off the black line altogether and then keep on going, then you'd end up with a fret that was lower than the surrounding frets and you'll just put yourself back to square one, which is completely pointless. Okay, so we don't want to do that. So I'm stopping each of these at exactly at the point where I can still see a thin strip of black pen every time. And sometimes uh, it, it kind of, you just miss it and you take a, it's almost taken most of the pen off and it looks like you've got a silver fret. As long as you stop at that point, as soon as it takes the pen off, you won't do any more harm. You're at the right sort of height. Um, and this will give us then a, a set of frets that are not only the right height, but they're also now back to the, the correct, nearly the correct rounded shape. And the next final stage of working those frets over the sandpaper will just take that final top scratchy bit that we've left there um, just finally sort of uh, smooth that over to join the rest of the, the nice um, curved contour of the fret and then um, obviously then take away all the scratching uh, and replace it by a polished surface. So and that'll be the final stage in this process. Okay. So um, I'm just going to turn off for a minute because you just get bored if I drag you through this whole process with me. So see you again in a, a few minutes.
Okay, here we are. Oh, sorry, you've got bright light in your face. I didn't mean that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Just trying to find out where I can put it. Okay, so we've got a guitar here that has all the frets reprofiled with the um, fret crowning tool. Ta -da. That came from Stumac, by the way. Uh, you can get them in different places, but uh, if I'm going to spend a lot of money on a tool, I tend to um, spend it with Stumac because they have a great reputation for uh, after sales service. And I think if you're going to spend 60 or 70 pounds or whatever it was on that tool, um, then you want to know that if there is any problem with it, you're going to get uh, an immediate refund without any quibbles or any um, hassle at all. So, um, yeah, that was the fret crowning tool. And now we're into the third stage, stage of the process. So here's how I think of this. Um, we've got to take these frets from what they are now, which is leveled, slightly rounded or mostly rounded, uh, to leveled, fully rounded and shined up. And the, the battle we're going to have is to um, iron out the scratches, the deepest scratches or the, the biggest gauge scratches that are currently on this guitar. And um, those scratches are going to be the scratches left by this file here, the um, fret leveling file. And there, those scratches are longitudinal scratches on top of each of these frets underneath the remaining black marker pen, all right? So the job is to get, to use a, a grader paper, I'm gonna use 240 to start off with, to, um, Sandpaper, sand down these files. Oh, files! I keep saying it. These frets um, until I've removed every trace of this file whatsoever. Then and only then, I'm going to use a lighter grade. In this case, today it's 600. I'm running short on 800, but a lighter grade, um, higher grade, but a finer grade of paper to remove all of those marks left by that paper. And then from that point onwards, I'm going to switch to micro mesh papers which will go from 1500 which is twice that down to 2000, uh, 12,000 which is really really fine and by the time we get there we'll, we'll be shining the frets not doing any more abrasion well it is abrasion technically but it'll just look like shining polishing um, and the challenge is really getting rid of these uh, and it's it's dangerously easy to think you've got rid of them and then carry on and shine up the frets and you think they look beautiful and actually you've just shined up a load of little tiny scratches which will reveal themselves immediately when you play the guitar. So to get rid of them, we're gonna use this, um, this grade and we're gonna do it. And after a couple of papers, when I've worn out a couple of papers, I'm going to do a very, very detailed up close check with, um, with a different set of glasses on and with this magnifying glass. I'm gonna make sure there is not a single mark from that original fret leveling file left on any of those frets. And if I find a single mark left on those frets, I'm going to repeat the, the whole thing with another piece of the same grade paper until there's no marks left. Only then I'm gonna move on and then we can start heading towards a finished um, fret job. So I'm gonna use two things to do this. First of all, I'm gonna use, just use my fingers um, because what's important is that we don't press too hard and we don't, um, we don't end up if we just got some paper on a block and we just went up and down here, we would just flatten these frets out again. So I'm going to use my fingers and allow them to go up and over the frets. And when I've stopped using my fingers, I'm going to use this uh, contoured foam block and to allow it to do the same. Because I want this paper to ride up and down the sides of these frets because to, that action will retain the roundness of it and accentuate the roundness. And eventually it will just be nice and smooth and round. Um, and I'm going to do that by hand. It's going to make a bit of noise, so bear with me. And the main thing then is we're going to make sure, as we do this, we pay pretty much the same amount of attention to all the frets uh, as we go along. Um, and the reason for that is this paper, uh, this certainly at this stage of 240, is well uh, harsh enough to take a fret down and create an uneven fret, a low fret compared to the ones around it. So if we stay on any one spot, we're in danger of doing that at this sort of grade. Um, so it's really critical in the early stages of this, all the way through, but particularly at the early stages, um, to make sure that we don't do one spot more or less than the others. And the challenging bit will be to get all of the frets. So you've got to consciously get right the way to the first one, 
right the way through to the end one and make sure you keep doing that in whichever direction you go you're doing all of them and that you're letting your fingers go up and down and the, the more you hear that kind of not clattering noise the better in a way because your fingers are riding up and down over the frets and it gradually it will wear away the surface of the paper transferring most of the grit onto here which is natural and you'll keep going until you've worn away the whole first sheet of paper and we'll then just move on pretty much to another one. Um, my experience shows me that often it's this fret and the last couple up here that retain the scratching marks or the, the little scratches longer than anywhere else. So sometimes we have to give a little bit of extra attention to these. Um, but it's a sort of, you're doing it with a bit of intuition here. You've got to make sure that these, these frets get done. Um, but not so much that you ignore the others. So it's sort of, you get used to it over time, how it best works. And you just keep on going. Ooh. Downward pressure. Now, I've done it all pretty much one direction. So what I'm going to do with the second piece is I'm going to go at it from the other direction to sort of balance out a bit. And this, in my experience so far, it seems to be a good way to do it. The longer you can do it with your fingers, in some ways, the better. Uh, the, the, the longer you leave out the, the block. The block is, I suppose it's not just for the sake of being old fashioned, but when you have your fingers involved, you can feel sort of what's happening. Uh, the minute you bring the block into play, it's quicker, um, and you can put more pressure if you want to, but uh, you sort of lose a, a direct connection with uh, whether or not this is, you can, you know, with your fingers you can really feel if they're going up and down over the frets in the kind of way you want. And uh, if you feel it's not, then you can correct and try, try to vary your grip. Um, but with the block, you won't notice that. Now, there's the first one worn out. Um, at this stage, I recommend taking the guitar off, lowering it as far as you can to the ground and brushing the dust off onto the ground because it's, uh, it is a lot of it and you don't want to just take big gulps of it, frankly. Okay, so now I'm going to change direction um, and just come the other way. I'm going to try and use my right hand again still because it's got the better sort of um, grip. So I'm shifting the whole body around to get access from this side. And um, again, I'm thinking all the time about covering all the frets, including those elusive first and last ones. I really want to get into those so that they don't lag behind the process. Um, and then those first ones, let's get them a bit more. So... Again, my experience is by the second uh, second paper, we definitely have taken the frets down a few microns, um, but relative to each other, they're all still level because we're pretty much doing the same sort of treatment to all of them, okay? With a little bit of extra attention on the ones that don't get as much cover because they're at the end. Right, now we're approaching the point where I would do a check. And this is the bit where you, you've really got to be slow and rigorous. And, and by the way, at this stage, your guitar is getting covered by this dust. Um, and don't worry about it. We're going to clean it all off at the end. Okay, so I'm going to just wipe the um, camera out of the way a minute so I can get in close to this and I'll look like a fool but don't worry about me um, and I might just for the sake of getting as good a light as I can on this now something I'm just going to do before I think it's probably good something I'm going to do that helps me to see I'm going to get at this stage because I've been going backwards and forwards so the the fret leveling fire went that way and my sandpaper has just gone that way if I take a, a 2000 grit and go across it sort of cancels out the reflectiveness of the strokes going that way and it dulls all the frets down for a moment but it's brilliant for revealing the 
darker uh, pits or potholes of the remaining scratches that I haven't got to uh, with my 240 grit paper. So this little dulling effect of the, two, of the 2000 grit is a really nifty uh, helping hand. I discovered it by accident one day. But, and so I'm going to change my glasses, give myself the best chance of getting this right. And you know, this, is, this is the quality control that's going to ensure that your guitar is as smooth to play as it possibly can be because there's no way I'm going to let a gritty piece of fret get through this um, and the only way I'm going to make sure of it is to is to be ruthless when eagle-eyeing it with the um, ink magnifying glass so my reading glasses if you like are going to help me zoom in and I'm also going to have to hand a pen because if I find marks uh, any of these little scratch marks, I'm going to mark it up and I'm going to force myself to continue the process. Now I've got to get so far up close, and I can see some already on this last fret, and it's always the way. The last two frets have got some remaining. You just cannot seem to get a shot of them in this process. And I can see them with the naked eye. So they're there, there. I'm just putting them here so I know roughly where they are. And then I'm going to go down the rest. And what you'll find, I think, typically, is the rest of the thing is pretty much there. And you've got to keep sort of moving, never just look from one angle. You've got to rotate a bit uh, just so you can get a bit of comparison with them shifting the light around, I think, is probably the best. Um, As I say, the, quite often what you're looking for at this stage is what looks like little darker spots or tiny little potholes, and often they, they'll appear to be running longitudinally. Um, you know, it might be on there. They appear to be running longitudinally um, because that's, of course, where the, the file ran, the direction it ran in in the first place. There's a couple on here as well, I think. So there's a bit of work to do, so we're going to need at least three papers. Now the next set, now I'm going to use the uh, block. There's a few here as well, still left, so my fingers haven't done it. So we've got a bit more to do. Yeah, they show up as look dark spots, and basically they're just remnants of that longitudinal uh, motion of the file. Couple here. We just want to do it. Now it doesn't matter if we have to go to four pieces of, of there's a few here now as we get down to this end. It's quite often the case. Alright, so this has told me that we we're nowhere near yet. Um, much as I'd love to jump into the the next stage of polishing, you know, to get rushed through the finish, it's no it's nowhere near done it. So I'm now going to use the Uh, pointed uh, pad and I'm going to concentrate on these ends for a minute because we've got to get the scratches out of these final ones. We've also got to make sure we cover all of them but we also know that we're not getting the same cover on these final ones as well so we, it doesn't hurt to spend a little bit more time but the fact that they've still got some scratches in them tells us that Despite trying to level this um, coverage out, we're not managing to do it. And then I'm going to turn the paper around the edge a bit to get a bit of more life out of it. Place the masking tape there because it's worn out. And again, don't be afraid to you know, lay it on thick, the more the merrier. So, 
you know, my experience has shown that if you think you're nearly there, but you've got some spots, uh, do more and do more than you think you need. As long as you do it all equally, uh, you won't you won't create a problem. You'll just guarantee smooth spread. So go further than you think you should go. As long as you do it all roughly evenly and you don't over focus on any one spot to create any unevenness. So that's what I'm aiming to do here is more rather than less. out of these this block well I'm here I can look at a bit more detail at the bone nut that is here and it's uh, it seems to be quite nicely uh, nicely done so it's, it's definitely been through the hands of a, somebody who knows what they're doing with them um, with guitars although what I'm seeing is that uh, that person hasn't gone as far as um, levelling the frets. Um, probably because they, you know, to, as far as they're concerned, they haven't needed to, but um, it's sort of half of the course with the reloved guitars. So I'm going to do that thing again, uh, crossing, giving us a, a stripe with the 2000 grit. Um, I'm going to just double check and again look out for any of these little scratches that are going to carry on past the next sandpapering level, which is the 600 in this case, um, and carry on and sort of linger right around to the end. Now I have a feeling that that's pretty much getting there. Um, yep. Yeah. Only one place I spotted one, it's right on the final fret, and it's on the bass string end. Um, I'll give it a little bit more attention now, but that will probably be, be it because that would hardly show up. Um, you hardly notice that because there'd be no case in the world where you'd be bending the, an E string over that spot there. But, but, you know, Okay, now I'm confident now I can put that in the bin. Now I'll move on to the next grade. Now I don't need to use the um, microscope, whatever, magnifying glass again at this point. I can now move straight on to 600. And I can be a bit lighter with this because. We've got the killer scratches out of the way. What we're aiming for now is just a, a good all over um, ironing out of the scratches and reducing them from 240 to 600 here. And again, 600 grit is, is enough to lower a fret, so you want to still be making sure everything gets done even amounts. block you see and it will come at it from both angles, that angle and that angle. All of which uh, in 
the long run, it helps to avoid flattening the fret uh, and, and helps to put the rounding, uh, keep the rounding on it. Okay, a little bit more with this, 600. Um, it's quite, quite, uh, quite abrasive still. So I think a little bit more of this will be okay to move on. over 600 stuff to the side and now we're going to move to the um, micro mesh and this time we're going to 1500 is the first jump so that's a big jump from six it's double at least double so we're going to need to take a bit more time on this this has really got to work a few more minutes to get the 600 scratches down to 1500 scratches Dirty the neck is now, or the fingerboard here, I should say. Um, I'm just going to switch sort of directions on this paper. Now, again, it's just so fine now, it's not worth trying to examine with the uh, magnifying glass to see. Uh, this is more, more really a start the clock and stop a few minutes later. Stay with me. Um, you know, it, you can't hurt if you carried on another couple of minutes. Wouldn't do any harm at all. Um, in fact, it would probably only just help. So let's do another minute more than we think we need, just for good measure. And then we'll move on to the next ones in the sequence very quickly. Kind of level, the, the more you do, the better a result you'll get. Um, you won't take, I mean, within reason, if you went there all day, you would eventually wear the fret out. But at 15, 1800, it's just going to help polish it really at this stage. started doing this I used to go through the whole set of micro mesh papers and then I would do a final run over with the Dremel and some uh, a, a mop on the Dremel and some some of these cleaning or one of those cleaning uh, creams um, polishing creams but I actually discovered that it wasn't really adding anything to the the overall shininess of it so I stopped doing it and it seems that 12,000 by the time we get there is plenty uh, shiny enough so not using the Brummel part of it saves about 15 minutes and a hell of a lot of mess. It seems to me a fairly good, uh, fairly good deal. Okay, it's starting to—you can see them starting to shine now. So we're in 3,200. Very close grades these are, so not too much time needed on them. Now to the 4,000, and then a couple more. Three more left after that, and we're there. Thank <laughs> you. 
seemingly hours after we began. If you're still with me, okay, take my hat off you. This 12,000 micromesh sheet feels like a chamois leather or something. It's, it's just incredibly uh, smooth. Right, there we have it. Um, loads of dust all over the guitar, which is fine. It's what we expected to happen. We'll clean that off with, partly with the brush here and then also with some, uh, you know, naphtha stuff. And so we're at the stage, ladies and gentlemen, where we can put away our shiny pads and whatnot. Woo! I shouldn't have done that. That's, um, that's the graphite powder. Good, very good for lubricating the um, nut string slots in the nut. Right, so it's nice to be able to pause for a minute, tidy up a few things, and um, basically get ready to remove the masking tape. Um, now, yeah, it gets deep carbon. Oh, no, that's the, that's the um, graphite. Oh, I've got a load of swarf. Okay, so no simple, simple way of doing this. This masking tape's looking like it's leaving a bit of glue now and then, so we'll have to kind of wipe some of that off with the naphtha. Um, but it's okay. It's uh, it's very easy to come off. It's naphtha is a good solvent for this. So this bit takes a while actually, sometimes. You've got to pick it all carefully. Um, see, yeah, quite a bit of res uh, residue sticking on here still. And, uh, Hello. Just at the unveiling stage after that works. It's stuck quite a bit of the, um, the old masking tape glue to it this time, but it'll come off all right. Um, now I've got my own new card, yeah, and I yeah. managed to activate it online yesterday, even though it said it didn't need to be because the don't pin tell any, don't tell them your pin number, right? <laughs> because because yeah. the pin number remains the same. Mm -hmm. So I did that yesterday, mm -hmm. even though I didn't. It said I didn't need to, right. so um, I did it, and it went fine mm -hmm. the second time I tried. And I went to use it in the supermarket and it said pin unrecognised. Oh. So unfortunately my old one's still working and I didn't cut it up yesterday. That's fortunate, isn't it? Yeah. Stupid thanks. So I know what to do now. Give them all a bonus. I don't know. <laughs> yes, have all my money. Um, yeah, know. it's a bit annoying. I was talking to Holly on the phone earlier when I came in. She um, She's about three weeks away from her report. Which means that once she's done that, she's beyond the master's point in, oh, into yeah. the PhD. PhD, yeah. So, um, and Steve's libel action, no. Libel? Not libel. What's it called? Yeah, thing, whatever. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Tribunal. Yeah, yeah, tribunal, that's the word. Um, is going to happen around the same time. So it looks like. It's now been made impossible for him to go back. Right. Not that he wanted to anyway, not, but... Not that any of my viewers care about this. No, but, I'm but sure. Don't worry. But, but the, the thing is, they're saying that it's Steve's personality that didn't fit, not the fact that he was being bullied. And I said, <sighs> if no, he feels like he's been bullied, then he has. And they well, that was, the, that was the line that education, yeah. higher education and used to no, take. No, that's what your match lady said. Yeah. The union no, no, I remember that. I remember yeah. That. So, um, anyway, that they only went as far as looking at five I issues. Hmm. The university looked at five of the issues, and there's about 13 or something. Anyway, so long story short, but his sister thinks that um, because he's now certificated as um, special, yeah. Um, that, that they should make an effort to be all-inclusive, and they're not. Right. They're not doing anything like that. So, 
but it sounds like he might be in for a bit of money. There you go. Well, I, I have to, Holly did sound a bit brighter. Join the club with all the other people who've taken millions out of that university. Oops. I know. Yeah. And all the others that you don't hear about, mm. like yours. Oh, gagging shh. order. Shh, shh, shh. I'll let it kill you. Um, um, this, this is proving to be the stickiest masking tape I've used. Well, that didn't low, work. Uh, I thought it was. It's the same supplier, right. but I'm just going to end up with a lot more to it's clean off. Oh, it's a bit of a, I mean, it's nice I that it's very sticky. sticky but sticky stuff remover, sticky label remover the other day. I thought that's what, that's what the naphtha is. But the what? Naphtha. Naphtha. This stuff, lighter fluid. Fluid. That, what's naphtha? Lighter fluid. Yeah, but what? I don't know, it's a substance man. Is it some kind of chemical? Yeah, this is really annoying. It's the first time I've ever done a guitar and ended up with loads of masking tape glue all over it. Mm. We'll get the nuts foot on it then. I will, but it's just could have done without that. Well, it will all go to cleaning it. It's pretty, isn't it? No, but nobody told me this tape was a, any well, different. Well, maybe you have to try it out before you slather it on. Huh? You think masking tape was masking tape, right? No, really not. Oh, God. Um, do you want some food? Yeah, at some point. At some nice. point, not now. Well, yeah, now or sooner than later, I suppose. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. It's lovely. It's not even very well done, really. Didn't, didn't you have it? Didn't we have it done once in a yeah a, a just, sonic a sonic tumbler. yeah but yeah. wasn't it an ultrasound cleaner or something something like that it's really weird it shined it's it up by through the show show the ring to the camera your diamond ring the there. <laughs> that diamond Cartier diamond ring has a really great story behind it um, and I'll bore you with it one time. Um, I found it basically. And, uh, it wasn't on somebody else's hand either. No, I, I didn't prize it from the grip of a long dead. <laughs> previous, previous Ponto. No, it's a long time ago. But it's very, very so lucky. I was listening to a guy saying he, when his first child was born, he bought her an eternity ring. And when his second child was born, he bought her another eternity ring. And he thought, hmm, this isn't really, you know, run out of ideas now. And the third anniversary or yeah. child or whatever it was he bought a rowing machine yeah. <laughs> lovely um, I think he probably wouldn't be having any more well, his filthy kids hmm? you get your own kids from now on <laughs> right um, well um, dinner won't be long okay so I'm just going to take off all this sticky goo okay. oh my goodness oh I was talking to Thomas about Chet Evans on the way to oh yeah Football, and I was saying, Tell me what you think of him. Uh, is mm. he a role model? And he said, I know the difference between a good footballer and a bad person. And I admire him on the pitch, but I think his behaviour off the pitch isn't very good. And I thought, That's really good, isn't it? You know, they don't yeah. give the kids any credit for being able to. I think he should be allowed, he, you know, if he's been served a sentence that the country has said uh -huh. is his. His, his penalty for what he did, or what the, what the jury decided he did, you can't keep adding penalties not, to it. Not when, not when he's still in appeal. Well, not, not certainly not on the grounds that you know his role model effort is terrible. When, but, when actually some of the people you, you're talking about know the hear, difference. Did you hear what that woman said last night? Yeah. That he was with Maybe. two other footballers, and they had sex with an another woman twice. It's gonna, this is going to put an R rating on my <laughs> guitar podcast. <laughs> both, of, both of the footballers had sex with the other woman twice, and he had sex with her most too. Of the, most of the jury's probably going lucky, so on. And, and um, they didn't charge them with rape, but they charged him with rape for some reason. <laughs> well, there's more details to all of that than we know. I'm sure but did you read in the paper, the one ever it was yesterday, that a, a kid in America, I think it was, um, went to a party and a girl went to the party know, and then I told her it. told her, her welfare person at school that she got drunk and she might have been raped, but she had no idea. And oh. they, uh, she didn't know whether she had, she just blacked out and couldn't remember anything. So in that time, 
think in a conversation it said, no, well, of course, because I was unconscious, you know, anything could have happened. And then she named a boy who could have done anything to her in the time that she was unconscious. And that got, boy got questioned, then he hung himself or killed himself, you know. Oh. Was, how shocking is that? You know, that you don't even have any, not even an act, there wasn't even an allegation of rape. But the fact that, you know, it became, the focus was on him. It's just terrible. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, let's, we'll discuss a few more <laughs> topics. current topics. Um, Friday night in the window. I've, I've already mentioned um, Paris and a few things like that, but I think I got away with them. I said I feel sad. Yeah. That's a lot of if I come there. out here and you're flying around like... No, I won't blow away in this wind. The Wizard of Oz. Right. Right, I'm done on the degooing front, thank goodness. Yeah. See you in a little bit. Right, let's just get this clean one to take a bit of polish. Got this stuff. You just get any of this glue anywhere and it just sticks and then spreads out. Just vile. Um, as I say, I'm not at all impressed with my masking tape supply today. Uh, that's the worst tape I've ever used. It's made an absolute easy job, suddenly a lot harder for me. Uh, and it's, it's, it's actually, amazingly, it's... it's it's going to require more solvent than I thought because it's it's sort of thinned it down and then spread it around a bit, um, which means I'm going to have to be quite a lot more liberal with the solvent to get the rest of it off. Uh, so I have to be on my guard now, see whether it's something to do with the finish on this guitar or whether it's going to do it to every guitar I attempt this weekend until it gets some more or change suppliers. But it's a pain. Anyway, uh, as long as I clean everything enough times with this sol this naphtha solver, it comes up beautifully. But it just does require a bit more. I need to change between cloths to, to achieve it. And it also probably means I need to do the sides again the same way. Yep. More the merrier. That's really frustrating. Not normally end up wasting more time doing that sort of thing, um, but it does indicate that if, if I can't if I can't um, rely on that tape, not to leave loads of goo around, I'm going to end up putting loads of extra time onto the process, which I really don't need, as you can imagine. Anyway, so as is, that's nice. I'm going to get one more clean cloth from the pile. Thankfully, I have some. To just get it to a shine so we can feel good about it. It's also it's great because it tells us, it confirms that the um, we've got all the uh, the glue, sticky stuff off. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Darren in particular, um, you can see that following quite some time, we have now restored the um, frets to a nice finish. I can see, I mentioned a couple of scuffs the guitar came with, which we can see there, which we can try and polish out uh, later on in the process. Um, with, in fact, using the cream and the uh, micromesh papers is a good combination. But by and large, we have done the fret leveling part of the process. And we now have, for the first time, uh, this guitar has a set of level frets. And, and from that point onwards, we're able to put the whole thing back together again and take care of the, the rest of the setup, which is looking at the action, uh, how it plays. Okay, so yeah, lovely and lovely and shiny. And as I say, the, the bone nut is a nice quality, so we don't need to do anything with that. We can leave that in there. Um, we need to, I'm going to have a quick look now. This is just going on and on, but I'm going to have a quick look at the uh, state of this pickup and see what's happened to the, the connection between the spring housing and the pickup because it's not winding in like it should. This one is not unwinding because the thread is absolutely screwed. Could be why nobody's doing anything with it. Ugh. 
horrible. Let me see if we've got a replacement. That's a shame. These are little things that you discover along the way. In fact, it's so bad that somebody's actually taken it off. It's the only way they've been able to get this pickup out. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, somebody's... Hmm. I don't know if you can see this, let's, let's unhook this and show you up close. The screw has knacked up at some point and somebody's ended up leaving a little plastic sheath in, um, which means it's no longer functioning as, a, as anything that's going to hold the pickup down, which is okay because we've got three other points of contact, but it's a shame. Um, so in a way you could say, well, actually what we're going to do, rather than just take this out, put a new one in, which isn't going to do anything anyway, if we do take this this one out, at least we can put a new one in that that won't. It doesn't do anything, so we might as well just leave that one. Actually, I'm not. I uh, don't mean to be slovenly or anything, but uh, it, there isn't any point because what we do need to take care of is this bit here. Um, so I'm going to look and see if we've got some um, springs I can put into action. Because um, we're going to need to a spring on there. Uh, I think what's happened is that the um, spring's gone from under there. But I don't think I think it's probably because there's nothing for it to hold on to. Um, oh, come on, spring, how'd you come? Well, here's one we could use. Uh, now I'll just go back to the pot and find the, the spring we took out. Sorry, the screw that we took out. It's quite a long one. We're just going to see if this will help it in any way. We'll put that through. It's a bit high-powered spring. We could cut it down actually if it's way too big. I think it is. No, it's not massively too big. The problem here could be that this, um, yeah, this metal thing's stripped its thread. So it's got no holding power. So the only thing that will uh, change that is either to fill it in with some solder and uh, cut through it, or to um, find find a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a, the, the bolt with a, a slightly heftier um, diameter, which which will hold on to it. Um, to be honest, I don't know if we've got one. Oh yeah, we do. It's gold, but it will be better than nothing. And I've got a better, more suitable straight spring, spring, spring. Okay, so you, you're going to pay the price on this, Darren, for having a, it'll have a gold, gold screw on the outside. Um, but at least it will, I think, it will work and do its job. Mm. <sighs> Maybe not too many times, but yep, that's holding on to it. So we've got that back. There's a little bit of paper shoved in there. I don't know why that's shoved in there either. Pulls it out. Says why do we need it? I don't know. I think it was probably somebody trying to hold this up. Okay. We're all right. Did that spring off? No, that's okay. Let's put that in. Let's keep turning it and see what happens. Nope. Dropped off. Maybe this isn't the correct diameter. Maybe it's not got enough. No, nah, it's not got enough bite. No. Okay, we need something thicker. That's not that one either. Uh, flat topped screw. Not meant for this, but. We just have to have something that will bite on to the thing long enough. I mean, there's, a, there's an option here. We could put it through as far as it needs to go in order to... Um, if we had a little uh, nut, that would work, but it doesn't. Um, that's a shame. All that's happened here is that the... It's very primitive. The casing that this goes through pickup eventually wears away if it gets wound up and down too many times and with the result that um, 
basically just is that too high that's too high yeah with the result that it just wears away slightly thicker and as a result the um there's nothing for the screw to bite onto anymore and it just falls off um We could try and add some solder to the edge of it, which might just give us enough bite. Let's try that. There's no harm. Might give us enough bite to. Um, I think we just need enough just to. Um, you can take this off a minute. Yeah, just enough to give us something to hold on to. So this is a bit that starts to take time. Um, because the problem with this is if we don't do it, you're not going to be able to raise your pickup up to the correct height. And that's why there was a bit of paper jammed in there. Somebody tried to do that by just literally um, hoping that the thing would sit at the right height because there's a piece of paper pushing it up from underneath. Um, it's, it's, that's a way of doing it, but it had obviously uh, worn out in the end. Um, I mean, we, we could do it possibly more effectively if we had no luck with this technique. The, the last ditch would be to kind of cut down a little bit of um, a little bit of foam here, and I'm sure that out of this we could make a little foam block that would do the work, um, and it would be adjustable in that we could keep going back to it and take off however much we need to get it to the right height or um, so there's my first position let's just try it to see anyway so we put that in there where does that sit too high not too much too high actually but it doesn't give you an awful lot of uh, maneuver I mean you've got to get it right the first time and also you've got to judge it based on how high you think the strings are going to be. Um, that's fairly, I mean, reasonable. I did notice that they were way under, um, way too low as it happened. Uh, okay. So that screw obviously went, still went through there, uh, but didn't do anything, so it just stuck through there and went into the into the foam stuff which we don't currently have a place for it to do that so this would need uh, a hole digging in it to accommodate but I will uh, I don't set fire to the curtains but I will try with the I will try with the soldering iron as well, but this would this would be a, a sort of workable version of it. Let's put that through there, that onto there, and that onto there. Fiddly, fiddly, fiddly. Right. So let me push this one all the way through to where we think it should be, and we think it should be fairly high. And we put that back on its little broken bit there, which is a shame. And that sits there, and then we push this one out a bit further. And all together, that's the sort of position it would sit in. And then this one has to get kind of pushed into the hole a bit further, which has to go through there and then into the foam, which I cannot guarantee. <laughs> oh, I can't get access to it. That, that has access to it. There you go. And this one will pull me down. And that one is still too high. Hmm. 
So a minute ago that was working, now it's all over the shop. That's because it's too far through, which is not what we want. <sighs> So the point is we've got to get this thing on a bit, but not too much. Otherwise it makes the whole thing sit incorrectly. Right. A bit like that, but not too much. A bit like that, but not too much. A bit like that, but not too much. Okay. Hmm. Let's have a look. This solves the problem without going to any more extremes, then I think we'd be okay. We've got three corners we can it down with successfully. One is the cosmetic. That block is now sitting at a comfortable even height. The, the problem here is that if we get through all of this and then it's ultimately you know a millimeter or so too high uh, because of where the foam sits we have to do quite a bit to unpick it and make the correction which is a right pain. But this is a, actually I think I'm going to stick with this as a simpler way of doing it. It's, it's evenly spread at the moment and um, I'll try and fly it around from a different angle. You can see it's sticking up at a, an even amount. It did need to be up quite a lot uh, on compared to where it was so um, that needs to be further down. We can, we can compress it down a bit more um, and we can bring that one in, in, in counterclockwise is what I'm looking for. Okay yeah let's leave that at that. That's not too bad actually. Um, I'll bring the front one out, which is clockwise, and hopefully this one works as well. Don't think we have to take that one apart the same way. Okay, so what you're learning, Darren, are a couple of little limitations with this. Um, the limitation is with the pickup itself. Um, it's the, the metal surround of the pickup that's worn, um, hence the problem that you can't get the purchase of the screw into it. Um, this one will always look a bit odd and it's probably always likely to appear to be sitting out slightly, but it's not a bad compromise. Um, and just shine them back up. They'll, they'll work perfectly well, just you know that one corner isn't very strongly attached because somebody who owned it before has kind of worn it out. But there we are. Right. So, uh, after several hours of fiddling we are now at a place where it's ready to start putting things back together again um, whilst doing taking care of any other little uh, problems we come across this, this is annoying this, this one because it's sitting sort of under pressure on the foam it's, it wants to pop back out a little bit um, it's just gonna have to live with that so I think I'm gonna go and get something to eat um, check the time I'm going to carry on more with this guitar tonight because I need to get it finished tonight. Uh, I've got some things to do tomorrow. And I might give it a quick polish over first before I go any further. Um, that won't be for a minute yet. Let's get this stuff tidied up. And we'll put a stop on this. So. Uh, after all of that, it's a bit longer than you'd imagine, but that's what it takes. Um, so you can see, you know, it's not a quick job, and uh, taking care of the little things is going to take time. And you know, uh, time is kind of money in some ways, but I'm obviously not going to charge any more for taking care of those things because I didn't have to. It's my choice to do that because I like uh, I like taking care of those details. Okay, so stuff just a little bit tidy that for a minute. Um, bits and bobs, they haven't been cleaned yet, still need to do those. Um, I will put this on its stand and we'll take care of, first of all, the various bits of equipment. Chip them all out there. And again, we can, we can do most of this with a, a fairly rigorous and quick. Um, sorry, I'm going to be dazzling you, aren't I, with this? I'm, I'm not being the camera. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to show you this bit, but suffice to say, uh, it's going to be a process of giving everything a quick clean over, so it's clean and all the bits are off it. I'll put that stuff back in there, and then we'll 
do a polish on the body with um, the polishing cream here, finishing compound and possibly the scratch remover. And then I'll come back to you when it's time to put all the uh, hardware back on and start loading up with strings because we'll be on the, um, the finishing leg or the last leg towards setting the action and then the intonation. Okay, so the hard work's done, um, but uh, probably another hour to go yet. Okay. So there. Oh, I think the lens is a bit dirty. Hold on. <laughs> Maybe we may have cleaned it a bit. Oh, sorry, bright lights. Oh, it's all... Anyway, look. Here we have... I think I better unplug it for this. Figure a little fly around. Here we have the V100 uh, starting to come back together again. Uh, I put on the various hardware. <sighs> Dust is settling on it again. Um, put on the hardware. Um, done a couple of little things. Cleaned all the hardware as well. Um, just really getting it back into shape now. Ready to... Um, yeah, next step we put the strings on and get it uh, get the neck loaded and get that set correctly. So uh, I'm just going to drop you down here um, and kind of keep on going from this angle. And also so I can plug the power in so we don't just cut off at some point. It's so annoying. Okay, I uh, probably can see all right from there. So what have I got to do? Uh, oh yes, various little things. So we have the uh, a little screw somewhere I need. One screw. Thank you. Thank you. One screw to put on this little plate. In fact, it's probably easier to put this on first. So there. Put the little nut on the underside of the scratch plate. shame because that's what I just spent time doing, tidying it up, put this on its side, and watch out because the bridge will fall off again as it kept having happened to me because I'm not being, paying attention. And You can't see this now unfortunately because first of all the lights in all the wrong directions, plus I've turned the camera away but I'm just putting the screw back in for the pit guard. And pressure to make sure it goes in. I'm going to need a different uh, different thing to do it. Otherwise it's quite so clumsy. Find the right one. Come on you, that'll do. I put a little bit of um call it lacquer on the chip already and I'm going to put a few more layers on as the evening goes along. Oh, I've got to get on there for God's sakes. Thank you. Not very tight. Not a very good screw, I don't know, excuse the expression. Um, I may need to replace this uh, if it doesn't go in properly. We'll find another one. I'm not sure about that. Not so brilliant, but what you can do. Now, what I have to do now, fun bit, is I'll just tap this in place. I have to then get a pliers under there and, and um, tighten this up with the help of the pliers. I, we could do it with a small spanner, but it would have to be a very small spanner. Um, uh, so I'll try and do it. With one of these. And again, a bit on the fiddly side, so it's a matter of getting a grip. I could be a bit more thingy with the light if I wasn't worried about where the camera was, but anyway. 
but that's okay. I've held it in place long enough. Get things out of the way. I've also um, tightened up the jack plug so that's nicely sorted out. So no more trouble with that rattling or moving. Um, and then the chip there, which you probably can't see very well, but it's darkened a little now. I've put one layer of lacquer on it. And I'll keep going until it's just proud of the surface and I'll let it dry out over a couple of days uh, before sanding it back a little bit. Um, so just uh, keeping things clean as we go. It's, it picks up a lot of dust in here because obviously I've done a lot of other work in here, particularly the stuff with the, the frets, so there's dust still floating about. Okay, so we're pretty close now, so well, we've still got a way to go. Um, when I say close, I mean it's time to put some strings on. i put the neck under load. So here we go. Our only ball nines. And we're going to use Gavin Downey's technique uh, that I learned from him online. Um, and that is a one over two under technique. So first of all, spring goes through. Uh, we go right through the thingy, hold, uh, pull it almost taut, uh, and then pull back a fret and a half, hold the string level, and start winding with the string winder. And as the, as the uh, surplus wire comes round, make it go underneath the taut wire and then as it comes around again this time we bend the surplus wire up and with our fingers we can't really see it very well but I'm going to put pressure on to make the, uh, the taut wire go underneath the surplus wire and then keep it there until it tightens up so we've basically got one wire above one coil above and one coil under and I've done all this without putting the bridge back on I'm sure you will notice that which is not a problem at all because I can still undo this and get the bridge in there. Um, it was just a little test to see if you were paying attention. Okay. Okay, so that's um, that's right down on the ground the action at the moment. So the first thing I'm going to do is just wind that up a few turns. sides and um, get roughly the same sort of action. Okay. Right. So we'll cut this off to about an inch spare and then we'll do the next one. Again, right now it's just about stringing it and putting the, the neck under load and follow the same trick at the end, all the way through, pull it back about a fret and a quarter, start winding it, make the spare, the loose wire go through underneath, pull it up and then use your fingers to help guide the, uh, the taut wire back under so it will stay down underneath. I don't like that, that's kind of caught on the wire. I'm just going to press it down so it goes directly under it. That's it, look at that. Again, putting it up onto its little thing. Uh, cut it with a little bit left over. It's a, it's a habit of mine actually, it doesn't really need that. The only reason I cut the extra, I leave it with the extra bit on there. Um, is because are we actually recording? Oh well, didn't really want to waste a load of data. Um, the reason I I leave it extra bit is for when I'm doing straps most of the time, or yeah, by and large most of the time, it's very handy to have that extra bit because if you have to take the string off and then put it right all the way on again, uh, really that extra bit can really help you get na navigate your way back up through the hell of the tremolo, but it's not really. Uh, it's not essential on the Les Paul style guitar at all. That's that. Can that go under? 
Oh, I've got no top, so it's getting up the right way around. This. This. The slack goes under. First time, and then it comes down the second time. Oh, that's clever. It'll come down. Ah. <laughs> now that means I think I've got way too much slack. Let's do this again. And you can see that get caught. No, we're alright, we're alright. Okay, I'm going to start that again. Start over, make that go under. Oh, we go the first time. Of course, when you put the neck under load, then the, the, the neck will pull some uh, the strings, the pressure of the strings will pull some curve into it, which is what we expect to happen. Okay. And I'll take a, a note of the, uh, the battery powered rolling damper I've got down there in a minute. Again, same thing here. Hold the string in place. Uh, stop the turning. Get the, get the excess to go under the first time. It's done. Crank up the spare so it's pointing upwards. And use your fingers to guide the slack under the sticking up spare bit of string. And also just sort of guide this bit in at the end as well because often it slips down the side of the bridge um, and can get very difficult. But I tell you what, I'm going to, to cut these off because since I don't need them, all that's going to happen is I'm going to end up cutting myself on them. So let's just solve that problem. From the outset, especially these little thin ones that draw blood a lot. Okay, so at this point in the game, it feels like we've been going forever, and actually it has taken quite a long time on this one. There's been a few little things to take care of. Um, but on this, the next stage is on this, or any other guitar, is to uh, put the neck under load and set the relief correctly. Um, and then once, that, once that's done, then what we're going to do is uh, set the bridge action uh, and then double check, uh, double check the nut action and set that right. And on this guitar, I'm hoping that it will be um, a fairly simple affair because I think it's, it was pretty good before. So I don't think we'll have to do too much in the way of cutting the nut slots. Sorry, I'm talking away from the mic view. So this technique of stringing um, comes thanks to uh, a, a New Zealander called Gavin Downey, who is a tech guitar tech for uh, a number of bands, and he has regularly has to change strings and set guitars up. In the intervals or just before gigs and in between parts of the gig and uh, so he has to be able to do it very quickly and also have very reliable t um, tuning for his for the, the talent um, and so he's developed a kind of method over the years but this is part of it so the one over and the others under process his, he's found is a very good way of ensuring String is, uh, is stays in tune very well, and he also has a process of um, bending, taking the slack out, the excess stretch out of the strings, which I'll show you in a minute, which I've found also works really well. So I'm doing it the Gavin Downey way. If you find something that works, keep on doing. Okay, and that's 
go off to the side. Just in time. Tighten it up. Right. So they are strong. Get rid of these bits. Get another set of strings used up. So just gonna put this under tension. I've got a guitar hanging here I can use actually. Okay, we don't have to be precise. So the Gavin method, um, don't worry about the action just now. So the Gavin method to take the slack out of the strings, first of all, is to take them and bend them horizontally um, with thumb, thumbs and fingers. Um, and do it once, tune it back up, do the whole set of strings, all six strings, once, um, then tune them back up and then do them again. And uh, he's found that within uh, two goes of doing this, he tends to get it to stay in tune, which I think is right. I've tried it and it's pretty good actually. Obviously you want to do this in such a way that um, respects the pinch points where the string goes over the nut, through the nut or over the bridge, because they are obviously sharp points. You don't want to be tugging the string sideways too hard around those areas, or else you um, may end up costing yourself a, a new string. So, you know, this is uh, this is something he says he does, you know, if he's in the gap, the break between different halves of the set and the band's taking a, a few moments out, then he'll do this and uh, take some five, five minutes or so uh, for each guitar. Again. So we're pulling sideways, um, you're stretching the string sideways, so all of that detuning is coming from the natural stretch in the string. Um, which, if you didn't do this, it would take you know, so much longer to come out, to, and you'd be tuning for a good couple of hours. Um, this is just a way of speeding the process up, basically. And it's not perfect because you can't get right up to the end by the bridge, and you can't. Can't get all absolutely last bridges of stretch out in just two rounds, but two rounds would be good enough to hand over the guitar and let the player get back on stage and carry on. So I'm doing this because it's just as well to do it now because when we all want it stable as much as we can when it comes to setting the intonation in a minute after we set the various actions. When I say actions, I mean the action at the, the bridge end and the nut end. There are two points. The, the frets on these V100s do have space under the ends of the frets. I've noticed that on not just this guitar, but other ones. Um, Okay, so that's the um, that's most of the stretch taken out of this string. And the action is not fantastic yet, and I suspect it's because first of all that's that's going to stay sticking up. There's nothing we can do about that. It doesn't look too bad. Um, I suspect it's because 
Um, well, first of all, we've got the action set in two different places on this bridge. Um, let's even that off a little, little bit. Slack the uh, the angle off. We don't want it too steep over there. That's, it. That's even, which will change again. The whole tuning will change. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is first thing I'm going to do is I know this is approximately a bit of dirt that comes off, approximately um, under under the right tension. So I'm now I'm going to look down the neck and have a look at what we've got in terms of bend. And we're actually uh, we actually haven't got any bend at all. So I need to put some. Well, we have on one side, not on the other, which is interesting. So um, a little bit. Hardly any. So I need to put some relief into this neck, which requires a turn of the old um, Allen key. And the last time we did it, we did it clockwise. So this time we're going to go anti-clockwise. Make sure that the key fits neatly first, because it's, sometimes it's very deceptive. It makes you think it's gone in, but it actually hasn't. Clockwise and stiff. Okay. Now what I did is I also brought out <coughs> brought out a um, capo so I can hold this fret down and check the, the amount of relief in the neck. I mean I can do it pretty much by holding this down, and checking the middle. At the moment there's almost none, so um, we'll need a bit more action there, uh, a bit more relief in there. So I'm now going to take this action down. Because we know that we can get it down to very small action, so screwing it in takes this, takes this action right down. I'm going to do that on both sides and level them off. Um, of course, the tension goes all over the place. I'm just going to tune that back up. Again, we're under the correct sort of tension. It doesn't hurt to give it some more gentle pulls if you have a moment or two. The action on this um, pickup is quite close to the um, quite close to the strings. Remember, we, we're sort of a bit limited in that uh, because of the the issue with the padding that we've had to do. But I can I can sort of push it and keep it around around about the right amount. That's good. That's plenty of distance, and it's about the same at the front. So it's nice and evenly balanced. Again, I'm going to uh, check visually check the neck relief, which again still isn't showing. Ah, uh, it's showing hardly any relief on the base side. Well, it has got some on the treble side, and that's interesting. So don't ask me. What that means as far as the truss rod is concerned. Um, so what we will find is if we put the cap on, expect, oh, sorry about this lighting conditions, I'm trying to make it use work, it's not brilliant. If I capo this off, cap on first, uh, and then hold down the last, we've got a little bit of uh, action there. A little bit there. Might just work. I will always have to be cognizant of the lack of height of this shed so I don't bash these things on the head. Okay, now that tune.
Well, that's pretty amazing action at the moment. It's a couple of little tiny buzzes here and there. Uh, that's because it's a quite, I'd say it's quite a bit lower than we had it earlier on before doing the fret leveling. So I'm, I'm not going to, potentially not going to go that low because it wouldn't be productive. Um, looking down here, we now have, it was 1.5 before and, and now we're at the, blimey, we've got one, one, uh, just about, just over one millimetre at the 22nd fret. So. Scratching has gone on the 11th fret because we've uh, definitely removed that amongst other things. Um, so, okay, so at the moment this guitar has probably got, judging by the gaps, when you hold down the last fret and the first fret, and you just check the, the, the distance or the amount of space. It's very small, it's quite small, um, but there is some space, probably not as much as there is on this treble side, which looks a bit bigger. Um, that's because there, there is a bigger relief on that side and it's just the way the neck falls unfortunately um, but the issue here is is so long as it's enough to make the notes play and you don't get any choking a little bit of a little bit of buzz on that side so I would probably go a fraction up on the um, on the action here which would be a quarter of a turn and this is a uh, Reuben, this is what you'd be looking to do. Quarter of a turn on both sides. Now, there, there is an issue here that says um, some of the. It, it's not bad actually. Mind the fact it's out of tune. Um, some of the, that slight ringing noise that's coming off the bass strings is because the the action set down here on this nut is a actually a smidgen too low. Never thought I'd hear myself saying that. Um, it's less than 0.2 of a millimeter. The ones that the uh, ones on the treble side aren't that low. Um, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm just going to bring you across here Whee! and try to make sure you don't get blinded by any crappy lights. Um, I may do a little sneaky kind of repair on here with a bit of uh, super glue and what to call it stuff, um, baking powder. And the reason why is that normally on a guitar, on this guitar, on any of these guitars, I'm the first person to want to get a really low uh, action over the first fret and just give this a little bit of support um, and I have a feeling that this is this is this, this is probably even lower than 0.2 yeah it is and this is just too low so that's what's causing this slight buzziness uh, not buzziness but occasional fizzle um, so whoever's done this has gone yeah god look at that it's probably 0.1, a tenth of a millimetre, which is a third, two, three times too low, which is really bizarre. God almighty, it's, it's not even getting a tenth of a millimetre under there. <laughs> this is really... Oh. Now they've done it, they've overcooked it. Okay, so the task for me, and I'm oh, sorry, just to go around to the other side, um, the task here is on the other side you've probably got the 0.3 of a gap. Um, no, okay. So you haven't even have gone over that one as well. Let's try 0.2. Yeah, looks of mercy. Hmm. OK, 
Okay, that's between 0.1 and possibly 0.15. Let's try uh, try this one on the same basis. Yeah, just over 0.15 um, for that one. And again, it's too low. <sighs> so what this person has done, the previous person, is they've set this so low, which is remarkable, and on one level it's great, because I like to see people setting these things low. The problem with that, then, is you get this situation. If you set that too low, you're, you're forced to raise the action high at this end, because if this is too low, the clearance on the first fret is too small full stop you'll get buzz so if you go below the minimum of 0.3 on here uh, all that happens is you don't get better action you get forced to raise the bridge in order to um, put right the fact that 0.3 is uh, 0.1 for example is way too low you, you'll inherently get buzz so what's happened is this is this is what interested me and I wondered why this guitar um, was set the way it was and you know, in some ways, they've got down to a pretty good, pretty good action beforehand, um, but we 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 don't have any chance really to even this out now, or even get below. Having done the frets, we can't get below. Not that we particularly want to, but um, we, we're just suffering a tiny bit now from buzz because this is suboptimal, um, and and it's a nice bone nut, and I don't really want to knock it out and put another one in. Um, but there's only two things I can do. One is I can uh, put a, a plastic shim underneath it and raise it up by about half a millimetre and then if I need to cut a little bit further to reset them all properly. Or uh, I can do a slight fix with um, the super glue and what do you want to call it? Baking soda stuff which creates a, creates a kind of cement which dries very quickly uh, and then you can re um, cut it with your, well, my, my nut slots. Um, I'm sort of loath to do that, um, but, I, but you know, th that's where we are. We're at a situation where, personally, playing this, Personally, with a combination of the ridiculously low action they've set here and the slightly ridiculously low action I've set at the hit this end because of done, doing the fret levelling, we actually now have a guitar that, that feels almost too low um, and suffers from a tiny bit of metal, not, I don't even, just a tiny bit of, tiny bit of buzz. And, and actually would would be even no problem at all plugged in so it's a real shame because like I say I, I'm loath to knock out such a nice bone nut and have to replace it um, I've, got, I've got a whole set of nut, nuts here misses um, but I've got one here that is a Tusk brand nut which would pretty much drop in straight away it's got a nice vintage colour um, that also has the, the slots are cut uh, slightly diagonal, whereas these are straight and probably choke a little bit going through. But um, you know, I, it's going to take a load more work. Um, or I could just build up a little bit onto this one since it's a nice nut anyway. But the point is, if if, you'd, if it's it's bone and you're then making making the rest of it out of super, super glue and um, baking powder then it's not really bone anymore is it for all intents and purposes um, alternatively I've got a brass nut here uh, which we could insert and take uh, take care of the whole thing in one go um, however that would take quite a bit of uh, leveling um, reduction work to get that down to the correct uh, dimensions Hmm. I've got another one here which is probably starting out a better dimension. In fact it is, I, I put it in on another guitar and it just went in straight away. 
Um, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you that question later on. I think, um, Darren. God, behind me, this. Well, on the other hand, let's 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 carry on. Let's get the bits done. Um, thinks to myself. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. If this plays well, if this plays well, I'm going to have to decide. Because the point is, I don't want to do uh, set the intonation on this. Um, don't want to set the intonation on this. If I'm going to do the whole change over nut. Um, so what I really want to do is just I want to get a feel for this. Um, I don't expect any clever playing because I don't. I'm not the world's greatest guitarist um, by any means, but I just want a feel of this. <laughs> Trouble with being a hoodie, wearing a hoodie. So I'm just going to have a feel, because I'm, I'm two minds whether to go the whole hog and do complete replacement. I mean the point is, as I've said, the issue we've got here is this nut is too low cut, which I never thought I'd be, you'd hear me saying that. 